Chapter 20 The chief was as good as his word, and we were soon plentifully supplied with fresh provisions. We found the tortoises as fine as we had ever seen, and the ducks surpassed our best species of wild fowl, being exceedingly tender, juicy, and well-flavored. Besides these, the savages brought us, upon our making them comprehend our wishes, a vast quality of brown celery and scurvy grass, with a canoe load of fresh fish and some dried. The celery was a treat indeed, and the scurvy grass proved of incalculable benefit in restoring those of our men who had shown symptoms of disease. In a very short time we had not a single person on the sick list. We had also plenty of other kinds of fresh provisions, among which may be mentioned a species of shellfish resembling the mussel in shape, but with the taste of an oyster. Shrimps, too, and prawns were abundant, and albatross and other birds' eggs with dark shells. We took into a plentiful stock of flesh of the hog, which I have mentioned before. Most of the men found it palpable food, but I thought it fishy and otherwise disagreeable. In return for these good things, we presented the natives with blue beads, brass trinkets, nails, knives, and pieces of red cloth, they being fully delighted in the exchange. We established a regular market on shore, just under the guns of the schooner, where our barterings were carried on with every appearance of good faith, and a degree of order which their conduct at the village of Clock Clock had not led us to expect from the savages. Matters went on thus very amicably for days, during which parties of the natives were frequently on board the schooner, and parties of our men frequently on shore, making long excursions into the interior, and receiving no molestation whatever. Finding the ease with which the vessel might be loaded with birch de mer, owing to the friendly disposition of the islanders, and the readiness with which they would render us assistance in collecting it, Captain Guy resolved to enter into negotiations with Tuwit for the erection of suitable houses in which to cure the article, and for the services of himself and tribe in gathering as much as possible. While he himself took advantage of the fine weather to prosecute his voyage to the southward. Upon mentioning this project to the chief, he seemed very willing to enter into an agreement. A bargain was accordingly struck, perfectly satisfactory to both parties, by which it was arranged that, after making the necessary preparations, such as laying off the proper grounds, erecting a portion of the buildings, and doing some other work in which the whole of our crew would be required, the schooner should proceed on her route, leaving three of her men on the island to superintend the fulfillment of the project, and instruct the natives in drying the birch de mer. In regard to terms, these were made to depend upon the exertions of the savages in our absence. They were to receive a stipulated quantity of blue beads, knives, red cloth, and so forth, for every certain number of pickles of the birch de mer which should be ready on our return. A description of the nature of this important article of commerce, and the method of preparing it, may prove of some interest to my readers, and I can find no more suitable place than this for introducing an account of it. The following comprehensive notice of the substance is taken from a modern history of a voyage to the South Seas. It is that mollusca from the Indian Seas which is known to commerce by the French name Bauch de Mer, a nice morsel from the sea. If I am not much mistaken, the celebrated Cuvier calls it Gastropedia polymorphira. It is abundantly gathered on the coasts of the Pacific Islands, and gathered especially for the Chinese market, where it commands a great price, perhaps as much as their much-talked-of edible birds' nests, which are properly made up of the gelatinous matter picked up by a species of swallow from the body of these molluscae. They have no shell, no legs, nor any prominent part, except an absorbing and an excretory, opposite organs, but by their elastic wings like caterpillars or worms, they creep in shallow waters, in which when low they can be seen by a kind of swallow, the sharp bill of which, inserted in the soft animal, draws a gummy and filamentous substance, which by drying can be wrought into the solid walls of their nest, hence the name of gastropeda polymonifera. The mollusca is oblong and of different sizes, from three to eighteen inches in length, and I have seen a few that were not less than two feet long. They were nearly round, a little flattish on one side, which lies next to the bottom of the sea, and they are from one to eight inches thick. 
They crawl up into the shallow water at particular seasons of the year, probably for the purpose of gendering, as we often find them in pairs. It is when the sun has the most power on the water, rendering it tepid, that they approach the shore, and they often go up into places so shallow that, on the tides receding, they are left dry, exposed to the beat of the sun. But they do not bring forth their young in shallow water, as we never see any of their progeny, and full-grown ones are always observed coming in from deep water. They feed principally on that class of zoophytes which produce the coral. The birch demur is generally taken in three or four feet of water, after which they are brought on shore and split at one end with a knife, the incision being one inch or more, according to the size of the mollusca. Through this opening the entrails are forced out by pressure, and they are much like those of any small tenant of the deep. The article is then washed, and afterward boiled to a certain degree, which must not be too much or too little. They are then buried in the ground for four hours, then boiled again for a short time, after which they are dried, either by the fire or the sun. Those cured by the sun are worth the most, but where one pecal, that's 133 and a third pounds, can be cured that way, I can cure 30 pecals by the fire. When once properly cured, they can be kept in a dry place for two or three years without any risk, but they should be examined once in every few months, say four times a year, to see if any dampness is likely to affect them. The Chinese, as before stated, consider birch de mer a very great luxury, believing that it wonderfully strengthens and nourishes the system, and renews the exhausted system of the immoderate voluptuary. The first quality commands a high price in Canton, being worth ninety dollars a pecal, the second quality seventy-five dollars, the third fifty, the fourth thirty, the fifth twenty, the sixth twelve dollars, the seventh eight dollars, and the eighth four dollars. Small cargoes, however, will often bring more in Manila, Singapore, and Bativa. An agreement having thus been entered into, we proceeded immediately to land everything necessary per for preparing the buildings and clearing the ground. A large flat space near the eastern shore of the bay was selected, where there was plenty of both wood and water, and within a convenient distance of the principal reefs on which the birch de mer was to be procured. We now all set to work in good earnest, and soon, to the great astonishment of the savages, had felled a sufficient number of trees for our purpose, getting them quickly in order for the framework of the houses, which in two or three days were so far under the way that we could safely trust the rest of the work to the three men whom we intended to leave behind. These were John Carson, Alfred Harris, and Peterson, all natives of London, I believe, who volunteered their services in this respect. By the last of the month we had everything in readiness for departure. We had agreed, however, to pay a formal visit of leave taking to the village, and Tuwit insisted so perniciously upon our keeping the promise that we did not think it advisable to run the risk of offending him by a final refusal. I believe that not one of us had at this time the slightest suspicion of the good faith of the savages. They had uniformly behaved with the greatest decorum, aiding us with alacrity in our work, offering us their commodities, frequently without price, and never in any instance pilfering a single article. Although the high value they set upon the goods we had with us was evident by the extravagant demonstration of joy always manifested upon our making them a present. The women especially were most obliging in every respect, and upon the whole we should have been the most suspicious of human beings had we entertained a single thought of perfidy on the part of a people who treated us so well. A very short while sufficed to prove that this apparent kindness of disposition was only the result of a deeply laid plan for our destruction, and that the islanders for whom we entertained such inordinate feelings of esteem were among the most barbarous, subtle, and bloodthirsty wretches that ever contaminated the face of the globe. It was on the 1st of February that we went on shore for the purpose of visiting the village. Although it was said before we entertained not the slightest suspicion, Still no proper precaution was neglected. Six men were left in the schooner with instructions to permit none of the savages to approach the vessel during our absence, under any pretense whatever, and to remain constantly on deck. The boarding nettings were up, the guns double-shotted with grape and canister, and the swivels loaded with canisters of musket balls. She lay, with her anchor a peak, 
about a mile from the shore, and no canoe could approach her in any direction without being distinctly seen and exposed to the full fire, fire of our swivels immediately. The six men being left on board, our shore party consisted of thirty-two persons in all. We were armed to the teeth, having with us muskets, pistols, and cutlasses. Besides, each had a long kind of seaman's knife, somewhat resembling the bowie knife, now so much used throughout our western and southern country. A hundred of the black-skinned warriors met us at the landing for the purpose of accompanying us on our way. We noticed, however, with some surprise, that they were now entirely without arms, and upon questioning Tuwit in relation to the circumstance, he merely answered that Madinon we papasi, meaning that there was no need of arms where we were all brothers. We took this in good part and proceeded. We had passed to the spring and rivulet of which I spoke before, and were now entering upon a narrow gorge leading through the chain of soapstone hills among which the village was situated. The gorge was very rocky and uneven, so much so that it was with no little difficulty we scrambled through it on our first visit to Clock Clock. The whole length of the ravine might have been a mile and a half, or probably two miles. It wound in every possible direction through the hills, having apparently formed at some remote period the bed of a torrent, in no instance proceeding more than twenty yards without an abrupt turn. The sides of this dell would have averaged, I am sure, seventy or eighty feet in perpendicular altitude throughout the whole of their extent, and in some portions they arose to an astonishing height, overshadowing the pass so completely that but little of the light of day could penetrate. The general width was about forty feet, and occasionally it diminished so as not to allow the passage of more than five or six persons abreast. In short, there could be no place in the world better adapted for the consummation of an ambuscade, and it was no more than natural that we should look carefully to our arms as we entered upon it. When I now think of our agrarious folly, the chief subject of, the, of astonishment seems to be that we should have ever ventured under any circumstances so completely into the power of unknown savages as to permit them to march both before and behind us in our progress through this ravine. Yet such was the order we blindly took up, trusting foolishly to the force of our party, the unarmed condition of two wit in his men, the certain efficacy of our four firearms, whose effect was yet a secret to the natives, and more than all, to the long-sustained pretension of friendship kept up by these infamous wretches. Five or six of them went on before, as if to lead the way, ostentatiously busying themselves in removing the larger stones and rubbish from the path. Next came our own party. We walked closely together, taking care only to prevent separation. Behind followed the main body of the savages, observing unusual order and decorum. Dirk Peters, a man named Wilson Allen, and myself were on the right of our companions, examining as we went along the singular stratification of the precipice which overhung us. A fissure in the soft rock attracted our attention. It was about wide enough for one person to enter without squeezing, and extended back into the hill some eighteen or twenty feet in a straight course, sloping aftward to the left. The height of this opening, as far as we could see into it from the main gorge, was perhaps sixty or seventy feet. There were one or two stunted shrubs growing from the crevices, bearing a species of filbert which I felt some curiosity to examine, and pushed in briskly for that purpose, gathering five or six of the nuts at a grasp, and then hastily retreating. As I turned, I found that Peters and Allen had followed me. I desired them to go back, as there was not room for two persons to pass, saying that they should have some of my nuts. They accordingly turned and were scrambling back, Allen being close to the mouth of the fissure, when I was suddenly aware of a concussion resembling nothing I had ever experienced before, and which impressed me with a vague conception, if indeed I then thought of anything, that the whole foundations of the solid globe were suddenly rent asunder, and that the day of universal dissolution was at hand.' 